Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Margaret Allen was born on September 2nd, 1906 in England. She grew up in a working class family and was number 20 out of the 22 children her parents had together. Growing up, she struggled with a gender and identity crisis so she drifted away from her family. She was not feminine at all, and she lived in a time where if a woman was more on the masculine side, they were not as understood as they are today. She rebuked everything female and considered herself to be one of the guys. She only had male friends, and the jobs she had were jobs usually reserved for men. Some of these odd jobs were working construction on houses, loading coal, and she was also a bus conductor. Being a bus conductor was her favorite amongst them all because it was not as labor intensive as the other ones and the uniform required her to wear pants which made her feel more comfortable. Unfortunately for her, she was fired after four years because multiple passengers had complained of her rude and aggressive behavior. If a passenger was too slow to getting into a seat, she would cuss them out and or push them in a seat. Part of her acting like a man in her mind came with a certain demeanor and she felt as if she needed to be tougher, look tougher, cuss, defend herself, and get physical just for respect. She also claimed to sometimes just get in funny moods. At the age of 29, Margaret felt that she was more than just a female lesbian, but a man. She left her home and checked into the St. Mary's Hospital in Manchester. Upon her return, she told neighbors that she went to the hospital to officially change her sex from female to male. Many today believe that this could not have been true because no one would have been willing to do such a procedure at the time, but whatever the case may be, she cut her hair very short, wore nothing but men's clothing, and asked people to start addressing her as Bill. Margaret would frequent men's clubs and only had male friends with the exception of a woman by the name of Annie Cook. Up until the time of her new identity, she hadn't had a relationship and she thought Annie could potentially be her first girlfriend. On one occasion, Margaret took a trip with Annie to a boarding house and they checked in as Mr. and Mrs. Allen. Although it seemed as if Annie was okay with her friend wanting to be a man, she was not okay with Margaret expressing that she wanted to be more than just friends. Annie denied her sexual advances and made it clear that she was only interested in a platonic relationship. After this event, Margaret kept more to herself and she encountered a string of bad luck. It was now 1943, her mother died, she had not worked for years, and let herself go. She used the savings she did have to live in a dilapidated building that was once the local police headquarters on Backup Road. She was refusing to eat properly, started a smoking habit, did not practice good hygiene, and suffered from depression. Annie encouraged her to take better care of herself, but nothing worked. On top of that, her health was declining, and she was surviving off of 11 shillings a week in welfare and 26 shillings a week in national health sick pay. Another thing that could have contributed to her depression and identity crisis was the fact that she was going through menopause. She complained of headaches, dizzy spells, and more. She was in debt and also behind in rent and was being threatened with eviction. It had been two years since she had paid an electric or coal bill and there were cases pending against her in court that she had not acknowledged. Fast forward a few years to 1948, Margaret's father was now dead as well, and none of her 21 siblings spoke with her. It was late August 1948, and a 68-year-old widow and miser by the name of Nancy Ellen Chadwick had been going around to different people asking for sugar. She was a housekeeper who lived about half a mile away from Margaret, and Nancy had money but she hoarded her money and preferred to beg for things instead. When Nancy went around town asking for sugar, Margaret happened to be nearby and said that she would give her some. Over the next few days, Margaret had visited Nancy at her home without bringing any sugar, and Nancy was getting more curious and fascinated with the woman in town who dressed like a man. The last visit to Nancy's home was on Saturday, August 28, 1948, at around 8.30 in the morning. Margaret promised to bring Nancy some sugar that upcoming Monday, which would have been the 30th. 
Margaret left, and just an hour after their last encounter, Nancy was walking on Backup Road and saw Margaret at the door of her house and asked if that was her house. Margaret replied by saying yes, and when Nancy asked if she could come in, Margaret replied by saying, I'm afraid I haven't got time, Nancy. You can see inside another time. Ignoring Margaret, Nancy invited herself inside and closed the door behind her. Nancy was found dead the next morning at 4 o'clock a.m. after a bus driver noticed a body in the road covered in rags and sheets. During an autopsy of her body, a doctor determined that she had been dead for about 10 hours before her body was found, and he also determined that it was not a hit and run like the bus driver suspected, and her wounds were more in line with foul play. Police went back to the scene of the crime, and two people said that they were in the street near where the body was found at around 3.45 in the morning, so investigators suspected that her body was put there after 3.45 and before 4. While investigators were looking over the crime scene, Margaret made sure to stay around and watch what they were doing. At one point, she had even walked up to an investigator, tugged his sleeve, and pointed towards the River Irwell that was nearby. She was then quoted saying, Look, there's something there. Investigators went to see what the object was that was floating in the river, and it was Nancy's handbag. It had a few things in it, but what they did not know at the time was that Margaret had taken the money out. Feeling as if she had thrown investigators off her scent, she went to a local bar and started boasting about being the last person to see Nancy. Over the next couple of days, she would go back to the same bar and let as many people know that she helped investigators and was the last person to see Nancy. The only thing that she did not realize was that she was now talking to nosy journalists. She was quoted saying, I was the last person to see the old woman, and she was an old fool to sit on the roadside bench counting her money. She had even told journalists that Nancy was wearing an underskirt that had a hidden pocket, but they thought, how would Margaret know that? It was now September 1st, 1948, and police called Margaret in for questioning. They briefly visited her house on one occasion and found nothing out of the ordinary, but decided to check her house again in more detail. There was blood in the doorway sill, and they also found more marks near her cellar. Some of Nancy's belongings were found in her home, and the biggest piece of evidence for investigators was when they matched Nancy's hair to hair on some of Margaret's clothing. When Margaret was officially charged, she gave her confession. As I was saying, I was coming out of the house on Saturday last about 20 past 9 in the morning when Mrs. Chadwick came around the corner. She asked if this was where I lived and could she come in. I told her I was going out. I was in a funny mood and she seemed to get on my nerves, although she hadn't said anything. I said I would have to go and I was going out and she could see me sometime else, but she seemed somehow to insist on coming in. I just looked around and saw a hammer in the kitchen. This time, we were talking just inside the kitchen with the front door closed. On the spur of the moment, I hit her. She gave a shout that seemed to start me off more. It was a few times, but I don't know how many. Nancy was then placed in the coal house. I've told you where I was all day. That part is true, and true that I went to bed at 10 to 11. When I awoke, the thought of what was downstairs made me keep awake. I went downstairs, but couldn't tell the time as all the clocks are broke. There were no lights in the road, and I couldn't hear any footsteps. Margaret had intended to take Nancy to the Irwell River, but she was not strong enough. Later, I heard the noise outside and knew they had found her. I looked out of the window and saw the bus. Then I went back to sleep. Just before I put the body out, I went round the corner and threw the bag into the river. I looked in the bag, but there was no money in it. I didn't actually kill her for that. I had one of my funny turns. I had no reason to do it at all. It seemed to come over me. The noise after the first seemed to set me off. The metal part of the hammer was thrown in the Irwell River and the wood portion was used for her firewood. She first went to court on her 42nd birthday, which was on September 2nd, and her trial, which was on December 8, 1948, lasted only five hours, and her counsel tried to argue that she was insane given her coming to court dressed like a man and her past behavior. Her lawyer was quoted saying she was guilty but insane. You can't just go around beating old ladies, of course, but given the stress Margaret was dealing with and her considerable need for privacy, it would be perhaps understandable if she had panicked and lashed out violently when a near stranger tried to push her way into her home. The effort to prove her being insane failed, and after minutes of deliberation, 
Margaret was found guilty and sentenced to death by method of hanging. Her longtime friend Annie Smith still cared for her friend Margaret and tried to encourage people to sign a petition to have her sentence commuted. Out of the 30,000 people in the community, only 162 people signed the petition. While locked up awaiting her death, many said that her behavior did not change from what it was on the outside. She argued with staff, was loud, complained a lot, and was not happy with how uncomfortable prison was. Margaret's execution was scheduled for January 12, 1949, which was just a little over a month after her trial in early December. Margaret was offered a last meal and she requested scrambled eggs, which was granted. When prison officials brought her her tray, she kicked the tray, causing the eggs to fly everywhere. She followed by saying, at least no one else will enjoy the meal. When it was time for execution day, Margaret gave no last words and showed no remorse before being hanged by Albert Pierpoint at the Strange Ways prison. Margaret was the first female execution in Britain since 12 years from her execution date, and she was the third to die at the Strange Ways prison. The prison chaplain wrote a letter that read, she was a woman with plenty of grit, and she faced it as a man would, and I felt the whole thing was brutal. She was well prepared and behaved like a man. In fact, she had more guts than most men I have seen. Before Margaret died, her first request was to have her friend Annie, who had been visiting her in lockup, to inherit her ring and cigarette lighter and the prison obliged. Her second and last request was to die like a man in men's clothing, but prison officials refused and she was required to wear a blue smock frock. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. If you enjoyed this story, please give this video a like for me. Do you think the prison should have allowed her to wear men's clothing or does it not matter what the prisoner is going to die in?